I think that we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order because in 20 seconds it will be five o'clock. Um, uh, Dan has a school event to go to, so he won't be here tonight. And then that leaves just seven of us. Um, first of all is the approval of the meeting agenda for tonight. Did anyone have objections, changes to suggest? No? And therefore, I need a motion to approve the agenda as published in the packet. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Um, I don't see anybody from the public here. Um, Items to be discussed. I guess, do we really have nothing to discuss? I guess not. <laughs> okay, staff, no way. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about my report that I submitted. Um, just, a, just a note of a thanks to Robin and John who submitted in parts of Public Service Day. This was written before that day happened, um, but I think overall it was a successful experience for staff, and um, I appreciate the very hard work of the committee that, that put together. We, um, I was gone uh, out of town, but so at some point maybe hear some highlights of the day. Yeah, yeah. we could do that next month. We just had this turned in before, though. No, yeah, I understand, but. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we'd love to share that. And we've got the slides we can show you and we can put all that. Uh, the only other update is there'll be the um, council meeting in January where department heads kind of go over their budget, um, budget requests that we sort of begin to share our organizational structure, staffing, any big changes coming up. This happens every year as part of the process. Um, this year, um, as always, I my approach will be to to be very positive, to thank council for support, but also to outline uh, potential service impacts of the the flat budget um, and what that what that might look like from the public side, um, in as much of a positive framework as we can do. But I think it's important that they know what those um, what any reductions or staying flat with inflation might might really become. And when is that? Meeting. It is the sixth. The sixth. Yeah, I, I could remember if it was. It's I think it's on the seventh. Seven, right? It's on a Saturday. Um, and trustees are, are more than welcome to come along to that. I can send the information once we get the official agenda email. It's an all-day meeting, so the, the city does a great job trying to break down approximately when your department will be so that folks can come and go if they succeed. Um, we talked about with the financial committee, the little committee that we are, <laughs> um, meeting before the next board meeting. Um, so will that, will we go over the there was some reason why we were going to do that. Was that the? I thought it was quarterly. It's become the, quarterly financial. Financial. Oh, the quarterly financials. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We could aim to have that meeting before the council meeting, if you'd like. That would be advantageous. It doesn't matter a lot to me, but no, it's it's before. okay. I just trying to put things together. Mm -hmm. I don't know that us meeting before that would have any impact on the council meeting in any way at <laughs> all, <laughs> because it seems like they have their own. Um, that plans for that, so we probably could wait. Yes, yeah, in your notes, you know, that another disruption at another program. Is there anything that we can do as a board to better support? I mean, it sounds like you guys are hand handling them beautifully, and because we had hoped that that last one was isolated and it mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be. Is there anything like that we need to do? more expediently, like looking at policies, or is there anything that we can or do to, or anything we that we can do to better support you? 
as a library? I or... think it's been, we've, we've been talking about sort of creating some guidance documents for staff, just sort of as, as a reminder of what steps we take. So far, there's been pretty easy access to the leadership team, um, and that's sort of smooth things very quickly. I think that one of my concerns is if something were to come up and there wasn't um, a coordinator readily available, all of our staff, of course, are empowered to make these decisions. We trust their judgment, but we, we don't want somebody to feel overwhelmed in making a decision. And when your adrenaline can get going, and mm -hmm. it can be a little harder to, to make a, mm -hmm. a good choice. But um, this particular, this one at the refugee program, um, I think it was less linked to the topic than it might seem at first glance. Um, and, and it may have been folks sort of seeking an opportunity to disrupt um, less than a, a very targeted activity uh, without disclosing too much about the, mm -hmm, the people mm -hmm. involved. It, well, you sent an email to the board, so mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I did. I found the, the 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 press report about the event totally different than what I mean. They made it sound like the presenters handled it um, well, and they did make it sound like it was targeted a bit. I I just got because you had sent that email to all of us, and I got a totally different story from that. Press release or whatever. Yeah, the, I feel like the the disruption was was fairly encapsulated. I mean, you were you were watching, so I think it feels much longer when you read the article. Like it was a a bigger length of time. I'm not saying it wasn't disruptive, but it absolutely was, mm -hmm. and the behavior was inappropriate and unwelcome. But it wasn't. Um, once it was handled and they were out of the room, um, you know, there was no further. Incident in, inside the, the meeting. I think the issue is what's seen, what's being streamed versus what's in the room. And if the press saw through the streaming, it looked like the facilitators were managing it. If you're in the room, it looks like the staff is managing it. Mm -hmm. But because of the placement of the cameras, it appears different. And when they had to pause it, the voice saying to the people in DC that were speaking that we need to stop for a moment, we have a disruption looks like the facilitator managing. It's just okay. how the cameras are positioned and the microphones are. So it's almost as if there's two viewpoints going on in a room, those who are in the room and those who are watching it on a screen. They may not have known who was staff and who was right. program yeah. They just heard a voice, um, right. So they just heard a voice saying stop, right? You know, how up should our hackles be about potentially any any activity we we host and it being disruptive if if the theme of the activity was not the reason for the disruption. I know it's a really open-ended question. Yeah, I mean I think it's I think it's so situational it's hard to say. And I, I I'm probably poorly framing this one. I I forgot that uh, I had to send as much information in the email as I had maybe. So you guys you do know sort of the players involved mm -hmm. and these are our folks that um, that have done this before. Yep. Um, so I, again, I don't know that it was that the impetus was the content of the program, um, but that doesn't remove the fact that it happened here and it was disruptive. Um, I think one concern with all of this is that it does model, um, you know, that, that Iowa City is not a bubble; that things can happen here. Um, I've been really proud of the way staff have been able to maintain focus on the behavior uh, very explicitly um, and make it clear that this is not about what what you're saying. It's the fact that you're not abiding by our rules uh, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I'm, despite these two happening fairly close together, um, I'm optimistic that this is not going to be a new trend. Um, I've spoken to a couple people on the leadership team about doing some additional training at an all staff meeting right before the next drag queen story time will happen just about, again, how do you approach this on a very behavior basis? Um, and 
of course, we'll, we'll try to monitor social media and things like that ahead of time to see if we see any hints. Um, calling the police is not our our first reaction to behavior issues at the library. I will say that in this situation, um, they were just an exceptional partner. I thought that they they really listened to the situation. They, I was impressed by the way that they sort of strategized about how are we going to minimize the disturbance? How are we going to get folks out of the room as quickly as possible and deal with the rest in a different space? Um, and and I did communicate to the chief afterwards that they, they just really did a nice job. Um, this is sort of an aside, but because of my experiences with the free lunch program, the police don't get called often, but every once in a while they do. And it's always exactly like that. They, they're so, so good and even handed. So I appreciated the email and the detail. You just never know when someone in the community is going to ask about yeah. what happens. So it, it, it was very useful mm -hmm. email. And I'll also say, I mean, I hope it's not a trend. Um, given how well you yeah. and the staff and the police can handle these things, it's really not a terrible thing. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're offering a forum People are participating, and then sometimes it gets to the edge, and you know um, that's that's really not a terrible thing in my mind. I think the next time you do the drag queen story hour, it'll be interesting to see if it in any way affects attendance. Right. And right. I mean, I kind of got the impression again it was from the coverage, but that it was sort of tied to the election cycle. Yeah, so, right. you know, it may be that it just isn't going to happen next right. time because they, they had to handcuff one of these guys. To, is that right? Did they give him a summons of some kind? So the, the interesting thing was I called the police specifically for one of the two gentlemen who was was not complying with our request to, to stop disrupting. As soon as you requested, uh, he, he didn't comply. So I called, I said, this is who I called out, this is who I'm asking you to, to remove because he won't listen to me. Um, the other gentleman was um, handcuffed and removed for a different reason. Um, that was an existing, was existing before the program and the police, um, that's where they intercepted him. And just because I had not asked for him to be removed at all. Um, it just was that's where they came together and, and they they removed him um it was that was not a particularly graceful process there was a lot of um shouting swearing um aggression from him as he was handcuffed in the lobby but again the police did a, a good job trying to expedite it minimize it um and I will give our patrons credit for, you know, they walk in the lobby doors, they sort of walk around the incident, <laughs> keep going. Um, I feel like there was a lot of um, standing to to gawk or, or make it into a bigger issue. Um, but I think that that was a confusing part for a lot of people who sort of saw part where all of it was, wait, do you get arrested for, for yelling back at a library program? And no, the person who I had called the police for was just asked to leave for the day. And he did he did comply after some some back and forth with the officers. My only other question is is there something that prompted this EPA thing, or is it just EPA needs something to do? <laughs> yeah, he just came in to the admin office one day and said, oh, um, regulations there, he said <laughs> sometime in the past there had been a dry cleaning facility in the vicinity. I don't know how close. Um, and that they wanted to do this testing. The EPA has done testing here before, but nothing as invasive as subslab or anything like that. They've done some air quality testing. Um, I did, like I said, run it by legal. I talked to Brad at length about it, um, and both both people sort of said it, it seemed like it'd be good to have the information. If it comes back with something we need to do, we would of course want to remedy any any issues that might be there. Um, 
obviously our hope is that if we do it, it comes back with a, a nice clean report. Um, and because we have a more modern building, I believe that testing would have been done before construction. I would be more nervous if we had a you know, right, a, a building that was um, hundreds of years old. Uh, but I, I did bring it to this table in case somebody here had uh, wanted to talk about it or thought that it was something that we wouldn't want to do for any reason. Is it possible that we can't read them because of all the disruption right now? I don't know. He didn't. She didn't specify radon or not. Dealing with all the different construction going on, I think. If someone could have had a positive radon wouldn't be tied to the historical use of the site. That's not, that's what he mentioned. The dry as far as I know. As far as I know, you don't. You just you it's just with there. all the, there's it's speculation, so it doesn't matter. It's yeah. just waiting for the results. Yeah. I just don't remember directly. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it's gonna have anything. How the information. I don't know yeah. how far away it was. I mean, in, I don't know if we're talking about it was blocks away or if it was because no one seems to remember the a dry cleaner. Uh, I mean, just kept it. <laughs> 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 they can't dig it up. This <laughs> what? Gravestones. Oh, <laughs> I mean, is there a cost associated with this? Are they charging us anything for this? Property? No, okay. they are not charging for the testing. Um, the issue, I mean, is that they find something? It would be, that would be the budget challenge. Obviously, staff are thinking about being outweighed. Right. Um, we'll figure. Uh, yeah. budget hardship, but I I did ask the city sort of what would happen if something came back and was a a high expense to remedy, and it sounds like it would be the same process as any unexpected cost that we would, you know, probably do a budget amendment and go from there. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and that was one of the reasons I wanted to make sure we go and approve and, and look at it as well, make sure that uh, we weren't walking into a situation that, that would be criticized and, and that had that hurdle to it. Other questions or comments about Ellsworth? Report? Okay, then we will move on to children's. Plan for winter meeting on Sunday. Yay. It's like you've been busy for sure with the yeah, really diversity, diversifying story time too. So I was telling Jason that I heard. I, I mean, I totally forgot to add one that I wanted to. So, um, but uh, we also, it was a collaboration with um, Victoria, the teen librarian. She does outreach out Southeast Junior High. And some of the students um, wrote their own story and they came and did a Saturday story time. And it was probably like one of the best story times we've oh. had. And it was absolutely fabulous. The kids were all engaged. They sang songs with the kids. Wow. They did shakers and they danced and they read their own story. And it was absolute. So, um, how many kids? What was it? how many junior high? There kids? was like six or seven of them that ended up coming that morning, and they want to do it again. So they're all still working on. So one kid had their story ready, and that was the one that they did. Um, so hopefully the rest of them will get their stories and it's on and we'll continue it. So yes, lots of different programs that we have done. The, the choir was well received. Oh my gosh, they said again, one of like the happiest, happiest story times. I was talking with Tom and his wife last night about the Stanley program. I didn't put how many kids were there, but they said about 175. They had only been prepared for like 50. Um, so that will be happening again because um, it's like a pure joy. That family strength too. So that was a great conversation. Barb said the um, scavenger hunt was a complete hoot. The kids are just running around and 
you know, the artwork is not particularly well protected. But nothing was damaged. The scavenger has go here. It's actually talking with downtown district for the turn in location for the elf at one of the places to turn in. Um, and we probably have collected about 700 um, oh, already. Um, the, the stack was like, this. Um, and I said, you have to come and get this. It doesn't, it goes on until January 1st. Um, but yeah, so they were impressed with. <laughs> Anything about a grand slam lately? Like, um, I mean, I worked a couple Saturdays ago, and that was all I did was stamp the elf hunt cards. <laughs> 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 I'm like, like, so glad there was another person there. But it was like, I all all we did all these really stamp about the elf. Yeah. <laughs> Kudos to the downtown district. So. Well, next year you can plan for a volunteer. That sounds like a really good use of a volunteer. At the welcome desk. Yeah. Go. Okay, so Anne, your report, as usual, is it's very enlightening. Depressing. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's an explanation of the problem, which I never understood until I read your report. Yeah, it's really well done. So next week, uh, ALA Core is having a forum on best practices of ebooks and audiobooks. I'm hoping some other library has some sort of magic um, wand solution that can, yeah. but uh, from what our practicum students found, that everybody just says, Yeah, it's a problem. What are you going to do? And yeah. until things really change, I think on the publisher side, we're, we're just going to have to make do. Can. Are there some antitrust issues here? I mean, oh, I know sure. this is yeah. yes. because it's an oligopoly now. Mm -hmm. The publishers are really an oligopoly. We call them the big five. And they seem to have set prices in concert with one another. That is in violation of antitrust law. Yeah, and the other player I didn't put in here is Amazon. Is, I'm sorry. Amazon. Uh, yeah. yeah. They the pressure to change pricing. Is, I mean, is the ALA doing anything about this? They're lobbying Congress, but until, I mean, Congress is Congress. So until they, I mean, there's been hearings about it, um, but that's as far as it's gotten. States have tried to do things, but those have been shut down in federal courts because the federal, federal government is in charge of copyright. It just seems so like the publishers would make more money if they had a more reasonable pricing structure. Like it just seems that this is prohibitive to like these libraries are the major buyers of books and print. <laughs> so yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So it just seems, I mean, my husband and I were crunching some numbers just quickly before this meeting because he had no concept of this. He's just always like, they don't have the number 23 in the series that I like. Right. I'm like, well, this is a big picture. And <laughs> so we started crunching some numbers and it just it seems like, you know, because it cuts small libraries out of the picture entirely. I mean, um, you obviously would have bought a lot more than eight copies of some of these books, which is far more. And it's just like ridiculous that they don't understand that if you can't get it. The people who can't get it from the library are not then buying personal copies. Right. Like it's not an overlap big market, as I think is the misconception from their end. It just seems like that's a foundational misconception. So it's been frustrating from the get-go. And those big blockbuster hits that we get 80, 120 to 200 holds on, people are waiting six to eight months for where you start grappling with how many thousands of dollars do we spend on one pile? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you say about half of the budget is going to digital content. What percentage, I mean, especially if you take out children's, what percentage of the circulation goes to digital content? Well, not anything like that. Yeah. I the last I want to say it's between 10 and 20 percent. So then you get it what you do with that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You buy mm -hmm. six more copies of the hard cover and just tell people. Skip. Yeah. 
you really want to read it. I mean, that's where we are in some cases, especially not fiction, and like forget the digital copy, we'll just put the hard copy on the shelf um, because I'm not paying $65 for a book that might go out five times. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that really makes the digital collection suffer because it doesn't have that backlist, it doesn't have that depth, and it doesn't meet the standards, which is what we really want to provide to the Iowa City community. Mm -hmm. I still don't think the public understands this pricing model. And I, I disagree that you're saying that with selling more copies would be in their interest. It's really not. Their interest is to make this high demand and, and to put multiples of profit rather than bring it down. It's, it's much more economical, but for them, it's a better model. But I don't think the community understands that they check out a book and never open it, an audio book, and return it, we've just paid, you know, and that. Their, their usage patterns affect this, but then our purchasing patterns do. And I don't, I'm not sure we have communicated well enough, not just as our library, but as the entire um, industry, how this is working. And I don't know if there's something we can do because it ends up affecting the public's perception of the library. When they say there is a waiting list of 60 people ahead of me, they assume we're ineffective. But we haven't found a way to communicate this well. I think that's a really good point. And I don't know if you have ideas on that. I mean, locally or you know, on a national level, but the pressure would then come from the citizenry. I think the other point that you made that was really interesting is the video access that belongs to certain makers like Netflix will now mean there's parts of society that will never have access to those materials. And that was the first time I had read that despite following this topic for a while. And again, how do we communicate the democracy aspect of the libraries? And, and I just don't know where we where we meet the public office. Well, I think some of the feedback from the brainstorming during the strategic planning process right. uh, in service day brought that up a lot, that we have to find a way to better right. communicate that. So I've been thinking about that. And now to your point, of, is there working with Manny on creating like a package that, whether that be videos or be blog posts or trying to get articles and right, or editorials is our role for the board in this also like yeah to just start explaining this issue because yeah it does make us it looks like we can't we don't manage resources we can't, well we can't, yeah right. we don't have the resources well we can't meet your needs mm -hmm. when it's really that would be hampered from an issue right. that nobody understands or knows i mean digital right, right. management we try to talk to people on the desk at point of view because we get that so come quite a bit. Why am I waiting so long? Why? I mean, it's not it's not a physical book. Why do I have to wait at all? Why can't I just get it? Why do I only get a right. um, items and yeah. can of beer or hoopla each month? And just explaining there's money involved and it's a lot of money. The other thing I wonder about is the consortium building that universities have done to respond to this. Is there any chance of building those consortiums? On a public level at a size that be large enough to influence this because the, the academic libraries change their model of service because of this. It would like, I mean, if all public libraries decided not to buy any books, right. any books you'd be holding the market. Yeah, it would be done. I right. really would. Or at least for a limited right. period, just to say the purchasing, but I, I don't know if, if ALA can build that sort of consumer power. And that hurts the, you know, your core values as a, as a librarian, like you're not going to provide access. But it's long-term versus short-term. Exactly. I, I just think this is going to be a, a bigger and bigger issue. Oh, and, no, and no. I don't know how we communicate. I don't think we've, we've effectively communicated it. Right, right. On a local level or on a national level, what's really happening here. Right. And if we want political reaction, we need to have the voter respond. And not just wait for Congress to have a conscience. Right. Sometimes wonder if there's a role the foundation can play in issues like this. You know, could um, I sit down in conversation with you on camera? We talk about this. We help the public to understand. Can the foundation write an op-ed? Um, you know, can we? Can the other uh, library foundations in the state um, work together to get something published in the Boy Register? I mean, it just seems like this is an advocacy issue that we could take on. Yeah, because at the end of the day, this is a this is a money pinching issue that's affecting us, mm -hmm. and it's a money is pinching issue that's affecting our our patrons. And so, if we take it through that lens and bring it to the foundation, it's a perfect marriage. I don't think it's only money though; it's a bigger issue on that's on fair. access across economic classes. That's fair, and we need to look at this in a different way. 
So this is the first time too when publishers talk when when they're asked by the press or they ask by ALA why they're doing this. They they are almost talking about libraries should really ever right. That's what they're thinking about. Right. 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 And this is like another first time where we're hearing like. Well, the libraries have been baked in the cake for that. <laughs> so American democracy is the first time here. We're hearing publishers say, no, I don't want my book there. Right, they're being open about it now. Right. Mm -hmm. Where before we knew it was there, but it wasn't explicit. Right. And now they have the permission to be explicit. Exactly. Where I think it shifts our responsibility for response. Yeah, and maybe they can't control the hardcover, but they certainly can control it. <clears throat> So, I mean, in terms of, I mean, we can just talk about it here, but like in terms of something that we can help be involved with, do you want to come back to us after you mow it over? I just, I don't think it's a matter of dumping it back on, on all of you, but there's something the board can do right. on a different level. I think we should partner with you. Thank you. But I do think that the key ultimately is, is library that all libraries i mean one iowa city library is going to change the behavior of our spy publishers you can just say well we're not buying it saves you a little money but it hurts the patrons and it's not going they're not going to care okay Anyway, thank you very much for the report. It's, 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 um, he's not here, is he? Brent's not here. His was also quite um, educational for me. I never really thought about all the technology that needs to travel around in the bookmobile. Um, and then the next one, Katie's development report. Other questions? Did everybody hear the discussion about the window? Or did that happen before the meeting? I think it happened before the meeting. The, the window is uh, set to be sent out tomorrow. So um, uh, I, I think I was under the impression it was going out a little bit earlier than that. So if this caused any, why haven't I gotten my window? <laughs> the questions in your household, um, you should be seeing it soon. And this really just addresses that we made some some slight adjustments to the donation form um, that we're hoping will um, increase um, donations. So of course, the, you know the QR code. Um, younger donors are are rapidly adopting and have adopted uh, QR codes as uh, a donation resource. Um, we decided to um, instead of highlighting a piece of programming. Uh, in that blue box, um, really create a call for action and help people understand um, how to engage and, and really encourage that monthly donating. And, um, you know, we would prefer people to donate directly to us and not through Iowa Shares, but um, Iowa Shares is an opportunity for payroll deduction for city employees and county employees and government um, employees. So I uh, just wanted to make sure that we kind of top lined that. and. Uh, they also have a ridiculously long donation <laughs> address, so just created a bit late for them so that it was much easier for folks mm -hmm. to, to get there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, you have to just take that little extra step. And um, that's pretty much it for that. I think it's not directly uh, relevant, but something I've always wondered about. So we have giving levels. Mm -hmm. what, what giving levels? Do and why do we have giving levels? Yeah, giving levels. Giving levels allow people to um, imagine and aspire to another level of giving. So we actually, in the online donation form, just changed the giving levels yesterday. Mm. So there had never been a ten dollar giving level, and it always started at fifty. But what ten dollars does is then you see that there's an opportunity to um, bring a recurring gift, and then you think to yourself. I could do ten dollars a month, mm -hmm. or um, I could do a hundred dollars right. a month, um, and so those levels also um, 
we also increased the highest level on that um, on the online donation form. It used to be a thousand, and we increased it to twenty five hundred. Um, I have found over the years, whenever I increase the highest donation level, um, a bunch of people just bump up. They go, oh, it's not like they didn't know they could get more. Right. <laughs> it's not news to them, but it's just it's just like a, you know, oh, well, this uh, this level is available now. Yeah, or or maybe you know maybe we can do that this year. Yeah. So yeah. it's just um you know. I always, I always kind of really observe myself watching myself make donations and love to read about how um, how other people interact with it. And um, you know, we we're open to suggestion in that moment when we have that feeling of generosity. Yeah. That helps us. Definitely help us. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I have. This is literally just a wild hair. Yeah. But I wanted to just. Sherry, it has to do with donation matching with people's employers. And I'm wondering if there's anything we can do to get encouraged to that, or especially local employers in particular. It's just something that's bounced around. We did add a line to the donation form yesterday to chat with the employer about whether um, they match donations. Um, there's not that I know of right now uh, a, a listing of matching um, employers. There used to be about 10 years ago. Someone maintained it on behalf of the community. It was great. Right. Um, but it does, that does no longer sure. exist. I'm sure that was a lot of work on um, maintaining that list. So hopefully, folks will just check with their employers when they see that prompt and uh, it will stop them. And hopefully, they don't check. Stop. That's right. the danger. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I, oh, never. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, to my knowledge, there's nothing under miscellaneous to go over. Um, also, to my for sure knowledge, the president doesn't really have a report. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, announcements from members. Anybody got anything they want to share? Um, I'll mention, I don't know if others did. I attended the City had a training on open records and open meetings available to board and commission members, and um, the slides from that are available. It was a good, good refresher. Nothing we don't know, I don't think. But it, uh, the one thing that did come up was it's presented by a Iowa League of Cities staff person, and their uh, understanding of whether a virtual participant counts towards quorum is different from our city attorney's understanding of that. So I think that's going to get rediscussed. So they, they say, if you're zooming in, you count right. uh, towards the quorum. So there'll be a little discussion around that. So. Well, I, 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 well, I think Robin and I went to the same one years a number of years ago. And of course, that wasn't even a factor. Right. But is it, a, is it our city attorney's interpretation of us, Iowa? Law or yeah. policy or yeah, it's pronouncement. Yeah. I think we're the only city interpreting it that way. Yeah. I think we're not one. I'm on a Johnson County Council, and we count yeah. virtual attendees as right. form. Yeah. I haven't gone to a single in-person meeting with that company. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. As I say, I think that was Stephanie Bauer organized the event. Yeah. She was going to take it to the city attorney. I think there's value in encouraging physical presence because I do think there's, I mean, we had some of the most deadly, boring board meetings during COVID. Where, I mean, you couldn't even get anybody to put forward a motion for heaven's sake, let alone second it. You, know. you do. I mean, there's, there's pluses and there's minuses, but I think that encouraging physical presence is is worth is worthwhile. You get more diversity of people who can't manage to get to your meeting because of childcare or economic right. reasons like public transportation. Right. So there's I'm strongly in support of rural participation because I think we would change the demographics of our board. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. It'd be significant. Um huh? the the, state yeah it's just of course, we don't appoint yes, board members yet who applies. And part of it is by when people apply, they're, they're told this is when your meetings are and what your um, participation expectations are. So it might change your applicant pool. Good. Speaking of, is there any, don't we, are we missing an, are we waiting for an appointee? 
Next so, month. and what next month is that? That closes January 3rd for the application. Oh, okay. So, it's still, if, if you have people to promote the idea to um, of joining the board or applying to join, uh, a little bit of time left for that. And then, um, if I remember right, we don't see them until they're in the council packet. Um, and then we have we can look at them through that vehicle. Okay. We we don't get input as a board. You may as a director, but no. we see it after the decision is made. We will not. Gotcha. The way he stated it sounded like right. It sounded like input, we can have a but it's right. the council rep deciding who's the representative. Okay. Yes. Okay. You have access to the applicant information. They put, they put all after selection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, after we have access to the information. When the, the when the packet comes out for that council meeting, so the, the decision well, has the not been made. The public packet, right? Right. In terms of our library packet, we've been getting it after the decision. But in terms of council packet, right, it would be in the council packet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, committee reports that the foundation or I like could make it. I was a like we're oh, well, not literally, but <laughs> on a plane. On a plane, no. <laughs> Dan's not here, so um, communications. The we have the couple articles. I think the comics and cookies is intriguing. Um, all right, so that brings us to the consent agenda. Um, does anybody have corrections or changes to the board minutes from the last meeting? No. And the disbursements, does anybody have any questions or comments about the disbursements? Let's make you pay closer attention to those overdrive. The other thing I noticed, and this is just really small, is the the background checks. Just I think I noticed it because it's the top of the report, but so it's forty dollars per check, and are those must be mostly volunteers? I assume that are, are we aren't hiring that many people. Any are we? staff and any new volunteers um, require a background check, and there's pretty active hiring. Um, you know, going on. Uh, pages often we're hiring, oh, and okay. we've we had this. We just did some hiring to bring them. Substitute librarians who work the, the sub weekend hours. Um, it just happened that a few of them moved on to different work, um, and so we were hiring for that. So it does look disproportionate this month, but, okay. but they do. Um, they it is certainly an expense that adds up, and there's just kind of a rolling that's it's hard to predict. Um. So any, no other comments, questions about the disbursements? Okay, then I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. A second from Derek, DJ, I'm um, sorry. Um, okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Opposed? Okay, and then the last thing is to set the agenda for the next meeting in January. And um, maybe we'll go a little bit longer next time. It looks like there'll be more to more to discuss. Um, anybody have things that they feel need to be added? No. Okay. Then that doesn't have to be voted on, does it? To set the agenda. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Well, especially we're okay. Okay, and the finance committee is going to meet for the first mm -hmm. time before mm -hmm. the board meeting next next month. Wasn't well, there some topic we rolled over from last month? It was right, something right. that we that moved to March. Okay. Except, is, is that the? Because I don't see anything in March either. But it, it was seems the, like there was something. The 802. It was or the, the policy review. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just seems like there was some recent. Okay. In that case, 
I think the meeting can adjourn.